What's going on, world? I'm Nick Ross, and this is Fish Tank Sessions. Fish Tank Sessions. What's going on, people? It's a beautiful evening in the fish tank tonight. And with me, I have Peter James. And this guy is one of my closest friends. But on top of that, Peter is one of the top promoters for EDM events in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. If there's a big event coming through, chances are he's going to be the guy that you turn to for the best prices for tickets. He's also one of the admins for the Electric Shadows community who currently holds over 2,600 local members. Peter's the type of guy that supports his community, creates a fun atmosphere for all people, and overall simply just loves to have a good time with anybody he is with. But enough from me. Let's hear what Peter has to say. I guess I'll start off a little backstory about myself. I'm not a native Texan. I'm from the great state of New Jersey on the East Coast. I was born and raised up there, went to a Catholic high school, ended up joining the swim team there, went to college, continued swimming, uh, D2 swimming at Bentley University, got my computer information systems degree from over there, and got offered a job at AT AT&T. And it was an engineering position. I did that for four and a half years. Moved down to Dallas to start the AT&T career. This is where their headquarters are, so it made sense. I had never thought about moving out of New Jersey. I thought I was going to stay on the East Coast my whole life. I didn't know a single person down here in Texas. I never even visited Texas before moving here. I just rented my apartment sight unseen. So it was definitely a big learning experience moving down here and getting away from the East Coast. And I enjoyed it. Everybody's so nice down here. Southern hospitality is definitely real. It's got to be a lot different, I mean, over in Jersey. I mean, my folks are from Queens. I was uh, born in New York. And, you know, when I still go back out there and travel, it's just just the vibes are very, very different. (laughs) Everybody's cutthroat. They don't hold the door for you as much. And they don't say thank you. And it's a very different vibe. But I, I enjoyed growing up there. And I think it's nice being right near the ocean. I was 20 minutes from the ocean from my high school. So going there after classes and stuff was definitely something I miss being in Texas. But lake life is so fun. Lake Louisville is definitely a good time during the summer. I can only imagine how many pairs of sunglasses are on the bottom of that lake. So many. A couple pairs of car keys from me. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. So you actually, so you swam. You were a swimmer? Yep, I was a swimmer. Wow. Did you know I was a swimmer? I did not know that. Wow. Yeah, I actually swam my entire life from fifth grade all the way through, I think up to my fifth year, or fifth year in college, my (laughs) freshman year of college. (laughs) I played basketball, I played football, but... You know, my passion was in swimming. My race was the 100 meter fly, the 100 meter freestyle, and of course the uh, 200 individual medley. There you go. You know, I like to go fast. (laughs) That's awesome. You are the the athlete. Not anymore. I didn't. (laughs) I wish. Same, same. So I did that. The Bentley thing came down here. Did the Dallas thing for a little while, and after I say about a year down here, I met Fyr, which is our Ray fan that we're both a part of. And a lot of good people in that crew. I met FYR, this girl, Sarah, she was a promoter at Stereo Live, and she ended up leaving. She didn't want to do it anymore. So I asked her, I'm like, hey, like, I've started making friends and started to make a little bit of a name for myself down here. So I'm like, can I start promoting? Can I try out? And um, got the job, and the rest is kind of history from there. So just build myself up just one step at a time. And that's kind of where you started when you kind of first got introduced to that level where you just became a promoter, selling tickets, you know, getting the community behind you, you know, promoting the shows that were going on in the Dallas area. And I mean, you know, just from seeing what you do, I mean, you you sell a lot of tickets, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you do. You have to sell thousands a lot of tickets. Thousands and thousands of tickets, yes. I sold probably the most for Ubby Dubby. I think it was 450 for Ubby Dubby last year. So we'll see what I get up to this year. But Lights All Night, always a couple hundred. But yeah, most shows I was doing over, even the weekly shows, I was doing over 100 a show for Stereo Live. So you started with just Stereo Live and then eventually branched out into other venues? Yep, started at Stereo Live, did that for about a year, then moved to Lizard Lounge, have been doing doing that for about a year. But we do other events too, like Southside, Bomb Factory, it just depends on the show if they want our help promoting or not. And then we do the festival, so Uppy W, Lights All Night, Freaky Deaky. So those are our, kind of our focus right now, but we're always looking for new opportunities and stuff and new people to work with. So we'll see how we grow in the future. What's that like? I mean, starting out, 
you know, being a promoter, selling tickets, it's got to be a little tough in the beginning because, I mean, ultimately you got to know, people got to know who you are in order to know, oh, this guy sells tickets. I'm going to get my tickets from Peter James. So like in the beginning time, when you first started working from stereo, how did all of that kind of work out to selling tickets for that one venue and then eventually branching out to larger venues, larger festivals, kind of how did that all work out in the beginning to where you're at today? Well, I guess I started with my rave fan behind me, but only a couple of people really going to those um, daily shows. They would mostly go to the festivals, so they would they would save up their money, and we would all get the group of us together. I think we over had out, had over a hundred people at our camp at Middle Ends, so we had one of the biggest group camps over there. We have an older crew, so they don't do the daily show kind of grind. Right. So I had to like find different people. So I just went on Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram to start following a bunch of people and getting my name out there, being nice, introducing myself, just hustling, just hit the ground running and making connections, making friends, just being there for people, being a good person. And it just grew because there's a lot of promoters and stuff out there that are very selfish and very self-centered and just try and like are only in it for the money. But I was never really in it for the money. I'm doing it because that's what I love to do. And I already had my AT&T job behind me. So I didn't need really any extra money at the time. So I was just doing it for fun. And it really shined through. Well, it seems though, like, I mean, like you said, for fun at that time. So you're getting out, you're being able to meet different types of people, all different types of people, people that are into all different types of music. And then you were reaching out to them, I guess, on social media, or they were finding you on social media. And then you guys are making that connection, which eventually came, Hey, you know, if you're interested in going to this event, you know, let me know. I sell tickets for that. And Let's get you there. Yeah, the majority of my sales probably come from just referrals. So somebody will have my number, send it to a friend and be like, hey, this guy has tickets. And you can't put a price on that. That's the most valuable kind of tool that promoters have in their arsenal because you're already getting validated by somebody. They already trust you. So getting the sale completed is kind of a breeze. It's right. not really hard. Because well, the, 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 I guess the most common way I would say would be, you know, they go to the event page and they buy a ticket directly whether mm-hmm. it be Eventbrite or it be Ticketmaster. Mm-hmm. And opposed to doing that, they can buy through someone like you or another promoter, which essentially is almost like a following that comes behind you. And then once they start buying tickets from you, then they could continue buying more tickets from you. And then eventually, I'm not buying my ticket from Eventbrite or I'm not going to buy it from the website. I'm going to go directly to Peter. Right. You usually save 10, 15% and you save on all the taxes and fees that always everybody gets so upset about. But we usually have them for the lowest price really possible. I see. So you actually, it's actually less expensive for someone to buy tickets through you for an event opposed to buying directly from the source. Correct. Like for festivals, it's 20 or $30. So we're talking about some pretty serious money that you could save by going through promoters. Wow. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And it's almost a no brainer as far as if you know someone that's looking at going to a show, it's almost like, Hey, I'm just going to go ahead and poke their brain here slightly and be like, Hey, I saw that you liked this on Facebook. I saw that you liked this on Instagram. You said that you were going to be going to this event. Have you bought tickets yet? Mm -hmm. No, I have not. Well, if you want to buy tickets, I sell tickets. And you know what? I can also give you a little discount on top of that if you buy through me. Right. Exactly. So what's kind of someone's response when you open up like that? That's what I used to do back in the old days, probably like a year or two ago. I don't really have to do that anymore because I've I'm, I'm established. People already know where to go. Like, and I already have like built a pretty like strong business. So I haven't really been doing too much of that. Like, kind of peer to peer. I usually just make a post and people know to follow my stories or follow my Facebook notifications. They have those all turned on. So when I make a post, they'll be able to see it. And yeah, but that is definitely one way to promote and kind of get the message out there that you have tickets and they're available now. And recently you just took on, I I believe if I'm incorrect, let me know, but I believe you just became the Disco Donnie street team manager. So you kind of moved up from where you were just kind of doing your own Peter James promotions. And now you're essentially representing Disco Donnie. Is that correct? Yep. I took over for my boss. So I definitely have a lot more responsibilities now. For the Dallas chapter, I'm the street team lead. We have about 20 members right now looking to grow the team to 30. So we just released a job application. So if anybody is interested in that, please let me know. I can send you the link to apply. But um, we're looking to bring more people onto the team, new people onto the team, and kind of revamp things a little bit and change how the way we do things to better reach our target audience. Sounds like you inherited an existing team of promoters. Did you, do you have any relationship with them currently or have you met them? Kind of tell us a little bit about them now as a whole, if you know who they are, if you don't know who they are as of right now. I know a majority of them through um, both like kind of professionally promoting and personal relationships. It was a pretty easy transition. They know who I like. I already have their contact information and everything in their phone. So it was a pretty easy um, transition from our previous boss to, to me. 
Do you have any big ideas kind of set? I mean, it seems pretty cool to be able to represent Disco Donnie and kind of be their, their street team lead. Right. So I'm sure as soon as that announcement came out, you probably had all these crazy ideas. No, for sure, for sure. The biggest focus is bringing um, ticket sales back to Lizard Lounge because we haven't been able to sell tickets for about six months. They did introduce it for a little while. They took it away, but all the other venues are allowing like promoters and to have direct ticket sales. So that's definitely my biggest focus and bringing that back to the team because then they're accountable for their promoting. And it's easier for us to see and track and show real progress and how they're doing that their their posts aren't just to nobody. They're reaching the people that we really need them to reach. So that's one of my biggest things for this year and just growing the company and trying to work with new venues and stuff. We'll see if we can branch out and we've already been doing stuff with Bomb Factory and stuff. So it's interesting. There's The market right now is huge right now for EDM. Most shows are selling out at the venues. There's definitely the demand is still there and it's only gone up over the four or five years I've been now in Dallas in the scene. I've seen it just grow and grow and don't really see any signs of it stopping yet. So it's an exciting time. Let's just say you took on a brand new promoter that's never promoted before. Maybe they're just kind of getting their feet wet. What is some kind of advice that you would give to a new promoter to kind of put them in the right direction to be successful? Be vigilant. Just know when you have deadlines. It's not rocket science. Anybody can really become a promoter. You don't really need that much background or experience to get into it. So there's a very low barrier of entry. So that means there's a lot of people trying to do it. So you really need to stand out. You need to be the one that always is the first to respond to a group text or going above and beyond. If somebody asks for making posts on social media, if you make an extra post or if you um, go above and beyond, the managers will see that and see that you're really working and that you want to grow. You want this to turn into something more that you're not just happy just where you're at. and You really want to move up in the company. And I guess that's the biggest thing is just to work hard and not only do your job, but try to ask for other opportunities and see where else you're needed. I think with anything you do, I mean, you have to work hard, you have to be available. And I could just imagine, especially like if it's something big, like Lights All Night or even Freaky Deaky, you know, with the amount of people that know you and know that you have the availability to sell tickets at a discounted rate. Sometimes, I mean, I don't know, maybe you can tell me, there's got to be moments where it's a little overwhelming, where you probably just get hit up nonstop all day, where you're probably just staring at your phone for 24 hours because people are coming in left and right. Hey, Peter, you got this ticket. I want to get this ticket. I want that. I want this. I need to get six tickets. I need to get four tickets. So how do you manage all of that in your day-to-days? It's tough. I want to be the person that responds right away. I don't ever want to have somebody like leave them waiting. So I mean, for our next big event is Ubby Dubby coming up. Um, the other night, somebody hit me up at four in the morning on a Tuesday to buy tickets, even though the show is still 90 plus days away. So I responded to her the next morning, but, and then that next morning, somebody hit me up at seven in the morning for tickets. So it just, it is a constant 24 hour a day kind of barrage of just messages. Do my best to manage, sleep when I can. And I think people do understand that they give me at least like a 12 hour window to kind of respond to them and stuff, which is nice. They don't expect an immediate response. Like on the days before a festival, especially when it sells out, like Lights All Night sold out this year, I had hundreds of DMs just trying to, people trying to get tickets, even even last though the minute. show was sold out last minute. But there's nothing that I can really do. I can't right. pull tickets out of thin air. And I told them that I'm sorry, that I made a bunch of posts. I had a bunch of tickets available earlier. Really just got to plan. Plan ahead in advance. A lot of shows are selling out now, so... It is. It is. And you're starting to see a lot more people at these venues. And I know even just from seeing it from my side going in, they're crowded. I mean, they're, they're packed to the max and you're even having shows that are selling out super quick opposed to before where they might even linger on till the day of, and it's just not like that anymore. Right. It seems like the scene is just consistently growing every single day. So, I mean, you really got to get to the the finish line early because if you wait and you, you kind of think about it and you ponder, then you might get to the point where, you know what, you might not even be able to buy a ticket. Right. Or if you do, you're probably going to overpay somewhere else. For sure. Because that's something that I see now constantly where, you know, people will just kind of buy a bunch of tickets up front and then they won't even go to the event and they'll just kind of sell them for 30, 40%, sometimes even 50% more than what the actual cost is. Scalpers are out there. You got to be careful. What's your opinions on that? On scalpers? I think there's definitely, I guess, misconceptions and different definitions of what a true kind of scalper really is. Is it the person that has an extra ticket and is just trying to sell it for what the market value is at the time? Or is it somebody that's doing it as like a full-time job and is always posting in the groups every week after week and everybody just kind of gets sick and tired of them? But I think people know the difference and people can tell if it's just somebody just selling one or two, if they had an extra ticket, they went through something like a breakup or something and they have an extra ticket available 
or that it's kind of institutionalized, have like just a set message that they'll send back to you that's very like kind of cookie cutter. You just got to be vigilant about it. Let me ask you a question. I always go to the discussion tabs on these event pages. And what kind of confuses me is that you always see so many people selling tickets on the discussion page. And it's always like these most random people. So what I do whenever I have extra time, which isn't often, but sometimes, you know, I got some time to kill. I'll go to the event page and I'll go to the discussion tab Mm -hmm. and I'll see all these people down the row selling tickets and I'll go to their Facebook profiles because there'll be people like, Hey, I've got three tickets, decided that I can't make it. And it's a show in Dallas, but that person like lives completely across the country. I mean, it just seems like an ongoing amount of spam that's on these discussion threads on the event pages. And is it just other people just trying to rip other people off or is it something else? What's your viewpoint on that? Scammers are definitely real. A lot of people for lights all night. I know dozens like personally that got scammed for lights all night trying to buy tickets. If a deal is too good to be true, it probably is. Again, just staying woke, as you would say, knowing what you're getting into. If they ask to send money to a foreign bank account or they're using a different phone number that's not a U.S. number. It's like the old Craigslist scams, like, <laughs> right? <laughs> that should be some pretty big indications that you're not dealing with somebody that's really in Dallas. I've even seen people like from Jamaica out there like, what is this? This guy bought tickets to this show out here. Like, what's he doing? Right. Like, <laughs> not going to the show, just trying to scam some some nice person that just wants to go have a good time. I mean, I feel bad for the people that fall for it, which I think, like you said, most people are kind of more woke and they're more smarter when it comes to that. I mean, I think people check out backgrounds and they make sure that they're, if they're buying from someone, they're someone that they, that looks legitimate. And right. nowadays you can kind of go check out someone's page and see if they're posting, see if they're getting any type of engagements and kind of make the authentication that, okay, this person's real or this person's not real. Add them on Facebook. If they don't add you back, that's a huge red flag. <laughs> Before you got into this, because um, I know we've, we've been friends for a while and we've had the uh, the luxury of, of going to a lot of shows, a lot of events and spending a lot of time together over the last few years. Yes, sir. In the past, you used to DJ, right? Yep. Back in college, I DJed a couple pretty large scale events, fundraisers for different fraternities, sororities. And the annual spring day, that was a really fun one that I got to DJ. But um, setting up all the production, it was a great learning experience. I'll definitely keep that more as a hobby. Like, that's not what I really want to focus on right now. But I definitely cherish those memories. I've done stuff in Dallas, too, at clubs back on Tuesdays and Thursdays with Ari. This Tom Notch Tuesdays, those were really fun. I look back on those with really fun memories. And that was over at Punk Society, right? Yep, that's correct. And Deep Ellum, they went away for right now. We might bring them back at some point. Yeah, those were definitely good times. What was your DJ name? (laughs) My DJ name was DJ Crazy Pete. That was a nickname I was given in college. Definitely have grown out of that now. (laughs) Need to change it. Like, I'll just keep it DJ Peter James. That's what I've been using. Not so crazy anymore, right? (laughs) Times change. Definitely settled down for sure. How did you get the nickname Crazy then? (laughs) What did you do? I don't know. I was just crazy, just going all over the place. I have a pretty big personality, so just. Doing a lot of different things, a lot of different people. I have a guess. (laughs) I have a guess because recently, whenever I was at your place, we had a birthday party and you popped this, like these huge tubes, which I've never seen before. I've never seen these tubes that you can buy and it was just like confetti. (laughs) And then, you know, I was creeping, I was checking out your old Facebook page and you like to throw that confetti out there, right? I've used them before. Do you think maybe that's kind of where it came from? Probably, yeah. I mean, I always liked to party in college. I was definitely always the one to raise my hand if somebody was like, oh, we should do something tonight. We should have a get together. I was like, my apartment, let's go. Let's go to Costco. Let's prepare. Let's stock up. And I stockpiled a ton of different DJ equipment, speakers, lasers, lights in my small little dorm room. I think in my single, I had a single bedroom for three of the years. We would fit 20, 30 people there. In, in a, a single like a bedroom? In a single bedroom, yeah. It was tiny. It was smaller than this room right now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yep, it was wild. We would have our own little nightclub. It was really fun. Oh, it must have been like a hot nightclub. Oh, yeah, man. very hot. Everybody was real friendly we there. We would definitely cool it down before the party. Did you bring like a separate AC unit in there? <laughs> they had really good. It was up in Boston, man. It's oh, it's cold okay. up there. <laughs> it's never really warm, especially during the Not school like year. Here. Nope. Very, very different climate. Well, let's kind of throw it back a little bit and just kind of you know, find out a few things about you. Do you have a favorite artist? (laughs) My hat I'm wearing right now. I I was going to guess, but I figured (laughs) I'd go ahead and let you answer the question. Definitely Nick Miller, aka Elenium. He's been one of my favorite three or four years now since his first album really came out. Got to see him at Leisure Lounge. 
that was a dope show. Said this guy opened for him. It was a very small, intimate show, and that was probably one of my favorite shows I've really ever been to in Dallas. It was just so real, so raw. It was before everybody kind of knew him and was on the Millennium bandwagon. So, and you got to you got to meet him a few times, right? Yes, sir. What's he like? Really nice dude. Very humble. Very down to earth. Met said this guy Trevor a bunch of times too. He's one of the nicest guys in the industry. But yeah, really all around good people. Just seeing some of Elenium shows, I mean, especially the one that was most recent in November at the Food and Music Factory. That was actually the day I bought my first Elenium jersey. And it was like, I always wanted to buy one, but I didn't ever buy one at the events prior. Right. So I told myself before I even went, I'm like, the first thing I'm doing, as soon as I walk in there, I'm buying a jersey. And now I'm so happy to own an Elenium jersey. Proud of you, man. I think I'm up to five, six, five. <laughs> just, just collecting them all like Pokemon, right? <laughs> I think there's 12 total, 12, 14 total. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. It seems like the jerseys are starting to be the takeover when it comes to artist merch. Yes, definitely. The baseball jerseys definitely um, have taken off. And I really like, I think I credit most of it to Elenium really popularized the baseball jersey a couple years ago, the black and white, the classic. He would always wear that at shows and it started kind of catching on and other artists kind of jumped on board, but I think Elenium was one of the first to really push that as his main merch item. Push the, the baseball jersey? Yep. Because yeah, now you see you see the basketball jerseys, you see the hockey jerseys. I remember when I went to a con this year, I mean, they had every jersey imaginable. They had the hockey, they had the basketball, they had the baseball. Seeing the hockey jerseys were just absolutely sick because, I mean, it's like the full long sleeve and it just looks so That's badass. <laughs> yeah, and now it's like... For somebody that wanted to go ahead and buy one of those now, mm-hmm. now like the resale on them is just absolutely ridiculous. Hundreds, if not like getting close to like thousands of yes. dollars for different jerseys uh-huh. if they're the right color, the right the right size and everything. It's pretty wild. I think about it from when I first got into the um, EDM scene. I, didn't, I wasn't really popular with merch. Mm-hmm. I didn't buy a whole lot. It wasn't until about maybe two years ago was when I kind of got into it. There's obviously always been some sort of a hype for it. And I feel like that hype has been growing now just with the consistency of other artists now producing merch. Mm. Besides Elenium, do you own merch from anybody else? Wanted to buy some Said the Sky merch, but I haven't yet. No, really just Elenium right now. (laughs) Just Elenium. Nothing wrong with giving all your money to the person you love. For sure. Do you have a favorite festival? I have a couple that definitely stand out. One would be Middlelands. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Uh, two would probably be just because of the experience and like the group we were with, um, Groove Cruise was amazing. And then third was Decadence Colorado two years ago. It was probably the best indoor festival I've ever been to. It was just insane, the type of production and numbers that they do. It was expensive. It was a long trip out there. I went to Lights All Night here in Dallas, 7, 27th, 28th, and then 29th was Decadence for Maybe I was a day off there. But um, I flew from here the night after um, Lights All Night. I flew right to Colorado and ended up missing my flight because I tried to get a little bit of sleep in there, tried to take a nap, and ended up missing my flight and having to spend a ton of money getting a last-minute flight to Decadence to, in Colorado. But um, it was so worth it. I would definitely recommend everybody check it out at some point. The Groove Crews that you mentioned, was that the same one that Jacob Cool was on? Yep, we all, that's me and With the FR Moody. crew? Yep, we got to DJ. That was one of yes. the highlights of the trip. I had Jacob here earlier in the week, and he we, we talked about that, and he was telling me kind of about that experience from his side, where essentially he was just going to be playing in the atrium, mm-hmm. and then that got canceled out due to, I believe, a wedding, and then he got moved up to the main stage rooftop deck. That was so much fun. <laughs> we were outside. We were at, on the main stage. We had a ton of lasers. We had the light guys. They were asking us what BPM we were going to be playing at so they could sync up the lights and stuff to our show. It was an overall really crazy kind of surreal experience. Being on a boat with a couple thousand people, 24-7 parties going on, it was just so much fun. And uh, looking back on it, it was very fun memories. When I heard about it, it was just, you know, I wasn't there. I wish I was. And I'm kind of kicking myself right you. now for not being there. But it sounds like y'all just had a killer time. And especially with just that movement of getting moved around and being able to play up there. I mean, that had to be just so surreal. Yeah, there was a wedding going on. Yeah, there was wind outside. They had to move them inside. There's a lot of people thought there was a wedding going on at first, but then they saw us come up on stage. So it was pretty interesting. Do you have a preferred venue that's kind of your favorite? Definitely Liz Lounge. Definitely Liz Lounge is my home. It's kind of the first place I started going to when I first moved down here. You get to know people week to week. Definitely. It is 
kind of a large scene. There's tons of people kind of involved in it. At the same time, the people that kind of go week to week, it is a kind of a family. I made a lot of great friends that will last probably my whole life just through going to shows, through the different rave fans that we're a part of and everything. So I've heard a lot of people give a lot of mixed feedback on Lizard Lounge. And I know, I mean, Lizard Lounge is pretty much like one of the OGs for Dallas, like one of the first. Been there for 25 years. Yeah, and you got to respect that. You really do. Mm -hmm. Why do you think some people have kind of a negative viewpoint on Lizard Lounge? Definitely because of the security. The security is pretty tight there, pretty rough. Which they got to be. I mean, it's a venue. I mean, you got to be a little bit tight. You want to make sure you're bringing in the right people. Right, for sure. And especially in the scene and the preconceived notions of what a raver really is and what we're kind of about definitely puts them in a tough position. They want to keep everybody safe. They want to keep the venue safe. But at the same time, people want to have fun. I guess just like the lines can kind of get blurred and people can always think they're right and they're in the the right. I think that they do do a good job there. I definitely support them 100%. You can't really be mad at somebody for doing their job too well. They've been there for 25 years. Hopefully they'll be there for another 25 years. They have a good business model. It's been working for a while. So I don't see if it's not broke, don't fix it. I've kind of heard the same thing where it comes to the security. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you, you got to do your job and you got to do your job to the maximum capability. And if you if you got these people that are coming in that might just be a little bit, maybe a little too intoxicated or maybe they don't have the proper identification or they're not wearing the right clothes. I mean, you got to kind of set the bar. I've heard that multiple times where the complaint comes from security, but you know, I disagree with that and I kind of respect what you just said because you do have to be at a level of maturity to at least get into the door, especially when you have big artists coming through and you're going to be in a crowded room. They want to make sure the place is safe for everybody. And that's definitely something that, you know, I can respect because especially being older, going to going to shows now, I still like to feel secure. I like to know that the place I'm going to is going to be safe. I'm going to be able to enjoy myself and have a good time and I don't have to worry. If I did have to worry, I feel like I probably wouldn't go there as often. I know Lizard Lounge is one of my favorite venues. I still go there all the time. Is there maybe another venue outside of like the Dallas city limits, like within uptown, downtown, where we have a lot of venues where we have like Lizard Lounge, we have Southside, we have Bomb Factory, we have Canton Hall. What other venue maybe outside of that particular area do you enjoy to go to? Texas Live just opened up. It's kind of a mixed property. They have a lot of different um, venues, different restaurants, bars, but it's a mixed space, indoor, outdoor kind of a venue. Um, There's been a lot more shows happening over there. Maybe trying to do something out there at some point. Toyota Music Factory has been having a lot of big shows. They've been having a lot of pull. It's definitely a lot bigger than kind of the venues downtown. When you move out of downtown, there's a lot more space to kind of build. That Toyota Music Factory is something else. I mean, that place is massive. (laughs) Any new um, venue will be nice and new and everybody will enjoy it. And I think they did a really good job with it. So let's touch back on your passion and your skill set back over to the promoting side. With taking over this um, team this team lead with Disco Donnie, what events particularly that are going to be, let's just say maybe in the next six months, I know you touched on Ubby Dubby, what other events might be coming through Forward Seeking? Ubby Dubby is the only one that we really have uh, tickets available for right now, but it just really depends on the sales, uh, the shows coming up. I think there's about a dozen different shows announced right now at Southside and Bomb Factory. The companies kind of wait to see how the tickets move before they kind of contact us and ask for our help. Because if they're going to sell the show out, they're not going to lose money by hiring our team. So Disco Donny kind of, they work with all the venues around here. Primarily Liz Lounge, that's our home base. We'll work with um, usually Bomb Factory more than Southside. But um, Southside is usually a Ticketmaster Live Nation event. Okay. So it just depends on the different promotional company behind the show and who's throwing, who's in charge. And just getting approvals and it's kind of a complicated process so if say a show is announced and we only have a month to kind of promote for it we'll probably not get tickets for it but if there's two or three months that we have time to really build out a team and push hard copy sales we'll get discounted tickets for it so it really just depends on the event has disco donnie ever thrown an event that maybe just kind of blew up in their face that you're aware of not that i know of recently I guess two years ago, Freaky, the first iteration of Freaky Deaky, there was a huge issue with rain and getting the rain out of the field that we were supposed to be going into. So it kind of made one of the stages almost impossible to get to. You basically had to wade through a foot and a half of mud. I was there. I remember it. It was terrible. So I really wanted to see, um, I think it was Artie that closed out that stage. 
that I didn't get to see because I didn't want to get knee deep in some mud. In the mud. <laughs> well, I remember even going this past year in 2019. I mean, the, the mud was just outrageous. It was nothing compared to two years ago that everybody was complaining about it and stuff. But the people that went the previous year were like, we'll take it, we'll take it. So the, so last year was almost kind of like a godsend. Oh, yeah, no, I, was, to- I did not mind it at all. I thought it was fine. I got a little bit of money. There's definitely my shoes that are still muddy, still sitting in my closet that I haven't <laughs> cleaned off yet. I think it was a huge success. We sold it out. And it's crazy to have these festivals that we're doing kind of for the first time. It's a new concept. It's a funny name. People really don't know what to expect and selling it out and definitely blowing away expectations has given our team definitely a lot more freedom to really expand this year. And for Hubby W, we're doing it in a new location. We're doing it at Globe Life Park. We're doing four stages. So that's going to be awesome. I think people aren't really ready for what we're about to bring to them. I know I'm not because I know when I saw that it was going to be at Globe Life Park, I was like, oh, wow, they're having it at Ranger Stadium. Yep. This is going to be pretty cool and unique. Mm -hmm. All right. (laughs) <laughs> so we're actually going to be able to rage on the baseball field, right? <laughs> yep, first base. That's where they're putting the main stage. No. <laughs> How many stages are going to be um, at WW? Four. Right now there's four. A fifth stage could potentially get added for locals, maybe. We'll see. Um, Disco Donnie loves as sales go up. If sales are doing really well, he'll kind of reward the people with adding new stuff and making sure everybody has something there for them. That's one of his big goals is to make sure – no matter if you're a bass head or love rhythm or trance, there's always going to be set in a stage for you to party at, which is I really love about all of the festivals that Disco Donnie does. He really tries to switch it up, put a great different variety of artists together that you really wouldn't see at kind of other festivals. What my favorite announcement was, and I think I could probably speak to a lot of people listening, was the Wakan takeover stage, mm-hmm. which kind of got released kind of a little bit later on after. Yep. So was that maybe something that was planned or was that just kind of like a pop up like, ooh, let's go ahead and throw a Wakan takeover stage because of all the hype that was from Wakan's first music festival. And it just seemed like it just popped up out of nowhere. We saw an announcement it was like, we got a Wakan takeover stage. Right. I don't have that much access yet. I wish I was part of those meetings. Maybe one day, as soon as I keep establishing myself. But um, my guess is that it was just made on kind of the fly. A lot of this stuff is just however kind of Donnie wakes up feeling one day and issues a memo to the team. Hey, let's build a fifth stage. And they're like, okay, let's get to work. Let's figure this out. Genius. <laughs> Absolute genius. Love it. But I it all I comes wait. from the top. Donnie is definitely still a very hands-on owner, which is nice to see. He doesn't just relax on his island down there in the <laughs> Caribbean. He has actually working. No, he's in it. He's in the dirt. He's getting his fingers dirty. So he's, he's putting in the work. And you he can did definitely shovel see hay. that. Two years ago, he was shoveling hay. There was pictures of him in his white boots. <laughs> Gotta love it. Gotta love the hustle. <laughs> Yep. Okay. So you said that you have eight people on your team now. Is that right? Uh, we have about 20 on our team right now, to, uh, 15 to 20. 15 to 20. And how many more people are you looking for to bring on? 10 to 15. So we're trying to grow it to about 30. So you've so, got, you got some work to do yep. to find the right people, right? <laughs> we already had about 60 applications, which has been awesome. The response has been great for people. And that was just from like one kind of social media blast and post. A lot of different people from different locations, different areas in Dallas, Fort Worth area have applied. And I'm... I benefit from the fact that I know a lot of these people personally. Right. I know which different rave fans they are. And you don't really want to put two promoters from the same rave fan. That's like kind of repetitive. Conflict so, of interest a little bit. Right. Yeah. So my job is trying to figure out and try to plan out who will be like the best fit and who will cause the greatest impact to um, spread the message of when new shows get announced and stuff at the different venues we support. So is that kind of how the, the research goes? So you get an application and then you got to kind of do your homework on that individual because it's not just like looking at a resume if no. you want to go get a job at <laughs> Walmart. I mean, we it's don't. completely different because it's it's almost like looking at someone's network. And so essentially when you get an application, what's your process to kind of filter out a valuable candidate? Really just looking at their social media. So their followers on Instagram, their followers on Snapchat or their score on Snapchat and um, Facebook, how many friends they have. 5,000 is the max um, that you can really have on Facebook. So, But if you have that many, like people have made second, third accounts. So you can kind of beat that in a way if you want to grow even more. Yeah, I guess I just look at their socials and make sure that um, they are active. They're posting they have friend groups that are in Dallas because if you just moved here and you're, you might have 10,000 friends, but if they're all in Denver, Colorado, that doesn't really help us much. Doing our homework and making sure that these candidates are the right fit for us. Right fit and also that they're local. Right. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Have you found anybody yet? 
Yeah, definitely. I know a couple of the people and definitely have reached out to them already and having them do a trial this week. So we're going to give them the kind of work that we have to do. It's really not too time consuming. It's like a couple minutes really a day that they really have to do any work. So it's not definitely not a full time job, very, very part time. But you get to earn free tickets to shows and other perks and it could turn into a full time job offer later on. So so are you still going to be selling tickets? Yes. Okay. For right now, I'm still selling tickets for Ubi. I really wanted to break the 500 barrier this year. When do you think you won't be selling tickets anymore? Probably I think, soon. I think that's something that's going to be a kind <laughs> conflict of, a, of interest. Yeah, 100%. I, I get it totally. I mean, you, at that point, when you're taking over the team, you got to delegate that to your team members, and I think that's going to cause maybe a little bit of friction in the beginning because of how many people that do know you and who's purchased tickets from you in the past. Right. When do you foresee that happening? where you're going to be completely hands-off from the ticket purchase where it's going to be delegated to your team? Probably in the middle of the year. So after Abu Dhabi, we'll be, it'll fully transition off of me and I'll just be managing, which will be nice. It's going to be so, so weird <laughs> not getting my tickets from you. <laughs> no, but right. hey, if at least I'm getting it from a member of your team, I right. know that I got the backing. It's trustworthy. I don't have to have the worry about it. And I'll feel confident with my purchase and I can, I can sleep well at night knowing that I have a valid ticket. <laughs> it's interesting kind of moving from the front lines, as you would say, and dealing with customers kind of to the back and learning the business and what kind of needs to be done on the back end. So it's been great experience so far. And I'm sure I will only learn more and get better as I go along. So I'm really looking forward to it and I'm blessed by the opportunity. Since you are still selling tickets now and the transition has not happened yet, if people wanted to find you, where can they find you, Peter? Probably the best place is Facebook. I might be maxed out at that 5,000 friends, so you might not be able to add me, but you can still send me DMs and stuff. So just Peter James on Facebook, Snapchat, Peter F007, and then on Instagram at Peter James Promotions. You guys heard it. Peter James on Facebook, Peter James Promotions on Instagram. I don't remember his Snapchat handle, so I'll let him say it one more time. P-E-T-E-R-F is in Frank 007. Boom. We'll make sure we put a link for that down in the description. I appreciate the time that you've spent with me today, Peter. I know you spent a lot of time with me already in general, and I could just say how much I appreciate you as a, a good friend, not only a human, but also a, a good friend that I, that I absolutely value. One of the OGs and one of the good ones. Love you, brother. Love you too, man. Is there anything that you want to kind of leave off with our listeners? Maybe a pro tip or maybe just kind of a shout out, anything that you want to give out to the crowd? Definitely get involved if you want to be involved with the team or if you want to DJ, if whatever kind of your calling is, definitely get out there, be loud. It's sometimes hard to be able to manage all the different people that reach out to us and want us our opinion on something. I try to do the best I can to get back up to everybody in a reasonable amount of time and offer as best feedback as I can. There's been so many people coming up through the Dallas scene that have just been working hard and just always trying to get that next gig and putting their name forward and really, really hustling. And those kids have been doing so well. Just keep trying, keep pushing forward. Your dreams will come true. Keep on keeping on people and all your wildest dreams will come true, whether you're in the fish tank or not. Have a great night.